the 14th century Lombard banks created the Dark Age. The Bardi, Peruzzi, and Exaioli family banks, along with other large banks in Florence and Siena in particular, were all founded in the years around 1250. In the 1290s, they grew dramatically in size and rapaciousness, and were reorganized by the influx of new partners. These were black elf, noble families, of the faction of northern Italian landed aristocracy always bitterly hostile to the government of the Holy Roman Empire. Charlemagne, 500 years earlier, had already recognized Venice as a threat equal to the marauding Vikings, and had organized a boycott to try to bring Venice to terms with his empire. Venice in 1300 was the center of the Black Gale faction which drove Dante and his co-thinkers from Florence. In opposition to Dante's work de Monarchia, a whole series of political theorists of Venice, the ideal model of government, were promoted in North Italy. Bartolomeo of Lucca, Marsiglio of Padua, Enrico Paolino of Venice, et al. All of whom based themselves on Aristotle's politics, which was translated into Latin for the purpose. The same coup made the Bardi, Peruzzi, et al. Black Elf Banking Super Companies, suddenly two or three times their previous size and branch structure. Machiavelli describes how, by 1308, the Black Elf ruled everywhere in northern Italy except in Milan, which remained allied with the Holy Roman Empire and was the most economically developed and powerful city-state in 14th century Italy. A century earlier, in the 1180s, Dutch Duke Ziani of Venice had provoked hostilities between the two leaders of Christendom, the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, the grandfather of Frederick II. Dutch Ziani, in time-worn Venetian style, then personally mediated the peace of Constance between the Pope and the Emperor. The Dutch got his enemy, Emperor Frederick, to agree to withdraw his standard silver coinage from Italy and allow the Italian cities to mint their own coins. Over the century from that 1183 peace of Constance to the 1290s, Venice established the extraordinary, near total dominance of trading in gold and silver coin and bullion throughout Europe and Asia. Venice broke and replaced the European silver coinage of the Holy Roman Emperors, the Byzantine Empire's silver coinage. And Eventu Ally broke the famous Florentine gold florin in the decades immediately leading into the 1340s financial blowout which blew out all the financiers except the Venetians. The Black Elf bankers of Florence did not simply loan money to monarchs and then expect repayment with interest. In fact, interest was often officially not charged on the loans, since usury was considered a sin and a crime among Christians. Rather, like the International Monetary Fund today, the banks imposed conditionalities on the loans. The primary conditionality was the pledging of royal revenues directly to the bankers the clearest sign that the monarchs lack national sovereignty against the black elf privateers. Since, in 14th century Europe, important commodities like food, wool, clothing, salt, iron, etc. were produced only under royal license and taxation. Bank control of royal revenue led to, first, private monopolization of production of these commodities, and second, the bank's privatization and control of the functions of royal government itself. By 1325, for example, the Peruzzi Bank owned all of the revenues of the Kingdom of Naples, the southern half of Italy, the most productive grain bale of the entire Mediterranean area. They recruited and ran King Robert of Naples' army, collected his duties and taxes, appointed the officials of his government, and above all, sold all the grain from his kingdom. They ate Robert on to continual wars to conquer Sicily, because through Spain, Sicily was allied with the Holy Roman Empire. Thus, Sicily's grain production, which the Peruzzi did not control, was reduced by war. King Robert said to relatives, the monarchs of Hungary, had their realm similarly privatized by the Florentine banks in the same period. 
In France, the Baruzzi were a cooperating bank, creditor of the bankers to King Philip IV, the infamous Francesi bankers Bicard Mouche, Albizo and Masiato Guidi. The Bardi and Peruzzi banks, always in a ratio of three, two for investments and returns, privatized the revenues of Edward II and Edward III of England, paid the king's budget, and monopolized the sales of English wool. Rather than paying interest, usury, on his loans, Edward III gave the Bardi and Peruzzi large gifts, called compensations, for the hardships they were supposedly suffering in paying his budget. This was in addition to assigning them his revenues. When Edward tried forbidding Italian merchants and bankers to expatriate their profits from England, they converted their profits into wool and stored huge amounts of wool at the monasteries of the Order of Knights Hospitallers, who were their debtors, political allies, and partners in the monopolization of the wool trade. It was the Bardi's representatives who proposed to Edward III the wool boycott which destroyed the textile industry of Flanders, because by 1340, it was the only way to continue to raise wool prices in a desperate attempt to increase Edward's income flow, which was all assigned to the Bardi and Peruzzi for his debts. By 1325, Geno's bankers largely controlled the royal revenues of the Kingdom of Castile and Spain, Europe's other supplier of wool. In the first few years of the Hundred Years' War, which began in 1339, the Florentine financiers impose on England a rate of exchange which overvalued their currency, the gold florin, by 15% relative to English coin. Edward III, in effect, now got 15% less for his monopolized wool. Edward tried to counterattack by minting an English florin. The mere chance, organized by the Florentines, refused it, and he was defeated. By this action, the Bardi and Peruzzi themselves, in effect, provoked Edward's famous default, and demonstrated his complete lack of sovereignty at the same time. In Italy itself, these bankers loaned aggressively to farmers and, to merchants and other owners of, land, often with the ultimate purpose of owning that land. This led, by the 1330s, to the wildfire spread of the infamous practice of perpetual rents, whereby farmers calculated the lifetime rent value of their land and sold that value to a bank for cash for expenses, virtually guaranteeing that they would lose the land to that bank. As the historian Raymond D. Ruver demonstrated, the practices by which the 14th century banks avoided the open crime of usury were worse than usury. In the Italian city-states themselves, the early years of the 14th century saw the assignment of more and more of the revenues of the primary taxes, gabelle, or sales and excise taxes, to the bankers and other Gelf party bondholders. From about 1315, the Gelf abolished the income taxes estimate in the city, but increased them on the surrounding rural areas, into which they had expanded their authority. Thus, the bankers, merchants, and wealthy Gelf aristocrats did not pay taxes instead, they made loans, per stanze, to the city and commune governments. In Florence, for example, the effective interest rate on this Monte mountain of debt had reached 15% by 1342. The city debt was 1.8 million gold flow rides, and no clerical complaints against this usury were being raised. The Gabelle taxes were pledged for six years in advance to the bondholders. At that point, Duke Walter of Brienne, who had briefly become dictator of Florence, cancelled all revenue assignments to the bankers, that is, defaulted, exactly like Edward III. Thus were the rural, food-producing areas of Italy depopulated and ruined in the first half of the 14th century. The fertile Contado farmland of Pistoia around Florence, for example, which reached a population density of 60-65 persons per square kilometer in 1250, had fallen to 50 persons per square kilometer in 1340. In 1400, after 50 years of Black Plague, its population density was 25 persons per square kilometer. Thus, the famines of 1314 to 17, 1328 to 9, and 1338 to 9 were not Natural disasters. 
Some of the famous banks of Tuscany had failed already in the 1320s. The Este of Siena, the Franzesi, and the Scali Company of Florence. In the 1330s, the biggest banks, with the exception of the Bardi, the Peruzzi, and Sayoli, and Bonacorsi were losing money and plunging toward bankruptcy with the fall in production of the vital commodities which they had monopolized, and which their cancer of speculation was devouring. The Exioli and the Bonacorsi, who had been bankers of the papacy before it left Rome, went bankrupt in 1342, with the default of the city of Florence and the first defaults of Edward III. The Peruzzi and Bardi, the world's two largest banks, went under in 1345, leaving the entire financial market of Europe and the Mediterranean shattered. With the exception of the much smaller Hanseatic League bankers of Germany, who had never allowed the Italian banks and merchant companies to enter their cities. Already in 1340, a deadly epidemic, an identified but not bubonic plague, had killed up to 10% of many urban populations in northern France, and 15,000 of Florence's 90,000 to 100,000 people had died that year. In 1347, the Black Death, bubonic and pneumonic plague, which had already killed 10 million in China, began to sweep over Europe. The richest families in Florence, Italy have had it good for a while. 600 years to be precise, a recent study by two Italian economists, Guglielmo Barone and Soro Mussetti, who compared Florentine taxpayers way back in 1427 to those in 2011. Comparing the family wealth to those with the same surname today, they suggest the richest families in Florence 600 years ago remain the same now. While it comes as little surprise that families pass on their wealth to their children, it's still somewhat remarkable that these families were able to maintain their wealth through various sieges of Florence, Napoleon's campaign in Italy, Benito Mussolini's dictatorship, and two world wars.